And we are live with Doug Lemov, uh, author of Teach Like a Champion, Reading Reconsidered, Practice Perfect, uh, also is a managing director at Uncommon Schools, um, someone who's been around a long time as a, um, as a key figure in training um, um, teachers and, and uh, improving instruction in schools, practical ways scientific ways, ways that have been tried and true um, in improving uh, improve, improving instruction. Doug, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm really glad to be on with you. Thanks for asking me, Chris. Well, I'm really, um, I'm interested in your new book, Reading Reconsidered, specifically because um, reading is at issue. <clears throat> Naturally, there's a discussion and not everybody is on the same page, but I like your part of the discussion because it's practical. Um, it's the how, it's the, you know, um, the hard skills um, yeah. that people need to do instruction. I don't think it's as much of the subjective argument that is happening about what people should read. There's a little bit of that in your book about the canon, and I want to get to that part first. Sure. But, you know, just to open up, there's a point where you and your co-author are uh, in a meeting at the, at the school network that you, you work at, and someone looks to you and says, hey, we need you to go figure out that reading thing. Right. So I'm going to ask you a question like, you know, like it's an easy question to answer. Yeah. Um, so you guys did that. You went and did some some a process of figuring out that reading thing in your own system. What did you find first? I mean, like, what are some of the high points of what you found in your discovery process? Yeah. It was fascinating because my first reaction when I was asked this was terror that I you know just wouldn't be able to figure anything out. Uh, I wouldn't have anything to say about reading. Um, and so we uh, attacked it with somewhere, be something between fear and humility. But I think uh, a lot of the things really, I think some of the things were things that I believed in an incohate way that it was important to think more deeply about and distill and codify. And some of the things were totally unexpected to me and were actually different from what I believed. And to be honest about it, had, you know, I had, I'd run schools and pushed our literacy instruction to do things that I now suddenly realized um, were not the most productive approach. And so there were there were some real surprises in there uh, for us as well. But you know, the easy part was figuring, and, and maybe the biggest surprise, just to kind of give away the, was the power of background knowledge, and the notion that reading is is not really a set of transferable skills. And I can, uh, I'm sure you'll want to talk about what that means and et cetera, and et cetera. But um, the realization that background knowledge is critical to reading is the easy part. The hard part is, so I'm a teacher and I've read some about background knowledge and how important it is. And people have told me that, and I, I kind of find that compelling, but I don't control the curriculum for my, for my district or my school, and I don't control the scope and sequence. So what do I do at 8.30 on Tuesday morning to be different to be knowledge driven and serve my kids as well as I can knowing what I know now. And so I think the really fascinating part was the nine miles of bad road that comes after you figure out what the destination is. Uh, but that's also the fun part and, uh, and kind of, I, I guess what, um, yeah, that, most of what became the book and then the, the curriculum that we've now written to go along with it. So one of the things that you said was a surprise is the importance of background knowledge. Yeah. Um, and I think that just fits in with what a lot of people who who look at the science basically say what you know is important to what you're going to know after that. Right. So. Right. So um, that doesn't seem like that would be a revelation, <laughs> though, but 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 it kind of <laughs> is. Right. Why? Right. Like, why is that? Like, I mean, as somebody looking in from the outside, I'm thinking, OK, yeah, it seems like. You would think that already. Why is that such a, a new, uh, I don't know, revelation for folks? It's a great question. I guess I can, only, I can only start by looking at myself and try to look back at myself in the period when I, maybe it's not that I didn't think that knowledge wasn't important, but that I thought that, I mean, it, the interesting thing is that people who say they believe that still teach in a way that I would describe as being skills driven and not knowledge driven. Mm -hmm. So I find people all the time who say, yep, yeah, 
background knowledge so important to students and then when you watch their lessons there um, here are the steps to making an inference and inference is the combination of what you know plus what the text what's written what's written between the lines of an inference then we have a little chant where we say uh, an inference is and we repeat what an inference is and then we try and make 30 inferences from talk everlasting on the presumption that that will make me better at making inferences when i read oliver twist or mm -hmm. narrative of the life of frederick Douglass. Um, because I believe that this that inferencing is a transferable is a transferable skill that um, the problem for students is that they don't know how to make an inference or what an inference is. And of course, I, I think what you know where you were, what you were alluding to is what the science says is that inference is context dependent. That mm -hmm. um, if I know the background, like a, I think a great the one of the watershed moments for this for me was reading with my littlest daughter and we were reading the little house on the prairie books and um she's a good she's a good reader she loves to read and we read a lot together and i was tucking her in at night and we came upon this sentence and it said in the middle of the week ma sent the girls to get the wash tub to take baths and this sentence is clear to me is supposed to tell you that something incredible is about to happen mm -hmm. and you're supposed to know that because if you know what people knew when Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote this book at the end of the 19th century and the American Prairie, people took baths on Saturday only, if that, to get ready for Wait, church really? on, to get ready for church on Sunday, because taking a bath meant yeah. dragging a tub down to the pump or to the creek and lugging water up and heating the water, you know, like pot by pot on the stove. And it, like it was really labor intensive and so people didn't bathe that often. So taking a taking a bath in the middle of the week is a sign that something massive is about to happen. Mm. But of course, my daughter didn't know that. And so I said, what do you think that, you know, what do you, why this clause on the beginning of the sentence, what do you think it tells you? And she, you know, she had a series of guesses that were very smart guesses that you would make if you knew absolutely nothing. And, you know, guessing is not really thinking in this case. And so I realized that the thing to do is to tell her, let me tell you a little bit about life on the prairie and what it meant to take a tub. Now, what do you think it means that in the middle of the week they're to, oh, it means it means that something really special is about to happen and so when she had the background knowledge she could make the inference when she didn't have the background knowledge she couldn't make the inference and it had nothing to do with how good she was at inferences and how much she knew about inferences and whether she understood that an inference was com combining what you knew with the hints that the author is giving you you know you i mean i can't speak for you but i will just say you or i have never had a great inference about particle physics because <laughs> at least speaking for myself i know nothing about it uh, and so, um, so, so I have a question uh, about this, Doug, though. So I think, I think the yeah. argument here is, is, is that the skills, things that we think of as transferable skills, I will teach kids to make inferences. This is a beautiful dream, by the way, mm -hmm. that I will teach kids to make inferences and then they will go out and they will be able to make inferences from any book that they read for the rest of their lives. I mean, I see why that dream is compelling. It is a beautiful, beautiful dream to think of what I have the agency to do as a teacher and what can happen to students as readers. The problem is that the brain doesn't really work that way. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, again, looking in from the outside, I hear two different type type of tracks in what you're saying right now. One track is basically if you get good at reading, period. If you have the skill of being able to read, you can read anything, um, regardless of the context, right? Um, that's what that seems like one lane of thought, and that really feels very common sensey. Like, really, like if I if you are a really good reader. Um, mm -hmm. you, you can decode almost anything and figure it out because you can read, but, the, but that's different from comprehending. Right. And that's my point is like, so the other thing is like, if you know the context, which you just said, like if you yeah. have context for what you're reading, um, the richness of what you read and what you understand from what you're reading is greater. But my thinking is that feels a little circular just in this one way. Mm -hmm. When you don't know something you want to get from not knowing it to knowing it. And the way that you do that oftentimes is reading, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, that's kind of the, the chicken or the egg thing, which is like, how do you figure out <laughs> how do you, so uh, this is like, a, this is one of the key ideas between how, behind how we thought about addressing the knowledge problem, both in reading reconsidered and then the curriculum, which is, Oftentimes the fiction that students read, you're reading, you know, your English class is based on a, on a great novel, let's hope, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is disconnected from like when we, from the nonfiction that you read. And so when we read, when I was an English teacher, 
when we did nonfiction, we would do like six weeks of nonfiction. It was his own unit during the year. And we would read a short article today on the naked mole rat and a short article tomorrow on the American revolution and a article the day after that on jungle ecosystems. And each time we read them, we would look at them almost in like a, f a formal formalistic approach. You know, what are the sub, what do the subheadings mean in this article? And what, what is the organizational structure of the article? But they were always disconnected from the novels that we read. And one of our great like aha moments was watching a teacher who combined those things and said, okay, in the course of reading this novel, I'm going to have you read a series of nonfiction passages that are going to illuminate for you different pieces of the background knowledge of the novel. And so you'll be practicing reading to understand. And the interesting thing is that um, reading the background knowledge will make your understanding of the novel more. You'll learn more from, not only will you understand the novel more, but you'll learn mm -hmm. more from it. And reading the novel will make your reading of the nonfiction richer. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. like a great example of this is, um, there's a novel that's often taught in fourth or fifth grade called Lily's Crossing. And it's about a girl who's, uh, she's living in New York City during World War II. Um, and her father's, her, father, her father's away serving, uh, serving in the uh, military in, in Europe. And there's rationing and there's uh, their victory gardens and their blackout curtains and all these things. And so these are actually great things to read um, a nonfiction article about because suddenly you have kids have a desire to know what, you know, what is a victory garden? Why would someone have, what is rationing? Why, why does it, why do I have to wait in line for butter? And so suddenly instead of reading these reading nonfiction articles for formalistic reasons and through a formalistic lens, I'm reading it to help me understand the life of this girl, Lily, who I care about. Mm -hmm. which is um, engages me more in the nonfiction. And I think explains, this is why we read nonfiction for exactly what you describe, which is when I want to know more about something, I go out and read about it. So we're kind of modeling that process. So I, I think one of the outcomes is that you get more out of the nonfiction and you get more out of the nonfiction because they're both happening in sort of knowledge rich environments. You know, and um, I can't remember if it's in this book or if in your previous one, I remember something about, uh, don't apologize for the content. Yeah. Um, don't say things to your students or like, you know, I know this is going to be boring, but <laughs> right. Right. Like, right. You know, right. Um, I also thought I saw something in there about you making the point about one of the things we want to do with kids is help them crack the social capital of the elite. And if mm -hmm. the elite are going to have this knowledge and this cap, this capital that they have, like intellectual capital, I call it a world fund of information, whatever, yeah. um, that you have to actually, in terms of equity, you have to get kids to understand that, right? Or, or actually crack that code. One of the things for me, though, that that raises instantly as a flag for me is yeah. this other discussion we have is in terms of what culture is and what culture mm -hmm. is important. And when you start talking about a canon, that means you, yeah. make, a, you make a choice about what's important for people yeah. to know. Like, what are the important books? Um, Diane Ravitch, for instance, in her book, um, Death and Life, that, that book, um, she has a canon somewhere in there. And it has people like Thoreau and Frost and you know others on there, like big names that you would expect. Has Martin Luther King Jr. and possibly James Baldwin on it. Right. But I looked right. at that list and I thought, okay, that's great, but that's not my canon, right? Like right. That, that's not my kid's canon. Um, the rub there is if your goal really is to get kids to crack the code of the elite, that's one thing. The canon becomes one thing because you need to know what they know. Yeah. If it's just to make them uh, a smart, productive citizen that's still in touch with their own culture, it might be a different canon, no? Absolutely. I mean, I think that um, reading serves a, a wide variety of purposes and it just serve. It's just sort of multiple purposes for students. One thing, if I was making choices for my own children, I would want them to understand some things about themselves and read some texts that spoke to them in ways that they already understood. And I want, would want some texts that challenged them. And I would want some texts that I knew that they were gonna engage in conversations about for the rest of their lives. I, I, would, I would make a, a unique and discreet <laughs> set of choices. And I think when I, when I referenced, when we referenced Canon in, um, in reading reconsidered, I think we meant two things. One, is we talked about an internal canon, which I think is really an intentional set of books by a school 
that represents the various reasons why you would want to read books on the assumption that content is important. And that includes a variety of things, one of which is some, some cultural capital, but one is, there are a lot of other reasons why you would choose and select books for students. And, and we use that phrase, you know, the, the word is fraught, and I think I knew that it would be fraught, and maybe, um, maybe it, it's, a, it's a little bit too much of like a red herring. When you say the word, uh, you mean can, can, canon. I, can, can, canon is a loaded word. And yeah. I think what I was trying to do was, was trying to repurpose the word to think about the, the, there are a lot of downsides to a canon. And there's some good sides to a canon. And one of the good sides to a canon is the, is the is shared text, which is I can presume that there are books that other people have read that I can then talk about. And so what we propose is an internal canon, which is a school making an intentional choice about books that they decided that every kid in the school should have read so that an English teacher in eighth grade can say, um, last year you read Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. How is this like? Last, the year before that you read The Giver. How does this narrator compare to The Giver? And so that we have a set of books that we all know that we all know so we can make, so we can have discussions across texts about them. I think one of the really different, difficult things about being a teacher of English now is name a text that I can, if I'm a ninth grade English teacher, that I can presume that every kid in my class will have read or at least be familiar with that I can make a reference to or a comparison to, there isn't one. So the internal canon is just the idea of making an intentional considered choice for the students in your school that includes a variety of, a, a group of texts that best represents the variety of goals you have for reading on the presumption that the choice of books really matters and that it's not that reading is not just a set of skills that we learn about which wh whatever text we choose is irrelevant. The text, the texts matter. Mm -hmm. Let's choose wisely and set a certain number of books that we know everyone will have read so we can refer to them consistently and because we think that they're really worth it. And I think that those can that, that can reflect books that are in the, like the traditional canon or a totally different. You know, we can canonize books that have not been not been previously recognized because we think they're just fundamentally brilliant and great. Um, so so if you and I are at a party in New York and we're at this party and we yeah. have a, we're in mixed company, but we know everybody's at a, a, a particular assumed um, level of class or status that, that um, what, what would be a example of a book that you would think it would, should, it should just be assumed that we all read. Shakespeare, probably. I hate uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare's I know, so boring. I know. I know. Shakespeare's <laughs> so boring. The movies are always better, yeah. and the and the work is just it's it's trash. Yeah. But to me, so so what? Maybe Moby yeah. Dick. You know. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I get. Yeah, it's it's great. I mean, I think it's important to at least have read one. Look, I, I you know I don't the canon shouldn't be made up of all. Um. Uh, you know dead ancient white males like, like Shakespeare. Uh, it should be a rich and diverse canon, but you know, he's the most referenced author of any in, in any in the world. Uh, and so it's probably beneficial to me, even if I hate it or don't think I'm going to, I mean, again, like with, I, I, don't, I don't, I think that a great teacher could make it come alive for you and at least make it a a valuable and interesting experience. But I think if you're, a, if you're a student and you're going off to do things in the world, um, when people talk about Shakespearean or Shakespeare, they talk about, you know, they make a reference to Hamlet. You should at least know enough to know what they're, given that he's the most referenced author in the world, you should know a little bit about what they're referring to and have some context for it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, obviously there's such, there's your own reading journey is such a powerful thing. And every, and every student finds that and you should, you should, Many to most of the books that you read in your life, you should read because you love and you know that you'll love them in advance. But I think there are some books, there's some instances where it's, and this is the argument for cultural capital, which is to have read one Shakespeare play and to understand what people are, are referencing so you can participate in the conversation. It's probably a service to, to most young people, I think. Yeah, I think I know that I know that some people will argue with that, and that that, that you know that's that's fine. That's why canons are yeah. canons are different. But a lot of people uh, will argue with it. I think in this yeah. one way, like. Um, going into a classroom, you're a new teacher, you go into a classroom, probably a lot of people are going to tell you that you need to find things that are relevant to the lives of the kids mm -hmm. that you're teaching to help them build on that so that they'll develop an interest in reading and, you know, it, it'll go from there. 
Like just build on that and you'll go yeah. from there. So that means you're going to end up with, you know, um, a full list of either black or Latino authors and books. And that's going to be kind of your canon for this particular classroom <laughs> or set, you know, uh, people that you're, you're, um, you're teaching. And then someone is going to come and visit and say, mm -mm. you know, like it's about the larger knowledge. It's about the, the larger world fund of information that you really should be doing what you just said, you know, Shakespeare and those other things. I just wonder when you do that. I don't disagree with either of those. I, I don't know enough to disagree with either of those. I think I agree with both of them. Yeah, that's kind of what it feels like. But yeah. but in the one way, I feel like, are you really missing? Are you still being a little bit culturally insulated and missing the fact that if you go into an all white affluent classroom and that's your that's what you pick um, for them, it's more native and natural to them, but that doesn't make it good or superior. And and if you bring that exact same set of books to a classroom full of kids of color who have a different mm -hmm. cultural understanding, you might be culturally culturally trying to remake them right that there's a there's an element yeah. of culture stripping in that behavior and it sure. feels a little bit like the indian boarding schools from years ago like right that's a good analogy i don't i don't disagree with you i mean i think that's why when i when i when we use the word canon in reading reconsidered we talked about internal canon meaning internal to a school that that's this is part of what a school does is, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. makes a decision about this what is the best balance of books to address the needs of our students, knowing that even that is a generalization, all of, all of our kids are different and they're gonna, have, <laughs> but given that we know them best, what, what's the balance of books for them to have a shared conversation about that we wanna to commit to as a group? Mm -hmm. uh, it, will it will never be perfect because there's so many things that we wanna accomplish. You know, both of those arguments are right. You should read books that, um, where you can, you feel a deep and intuitive connection to the protagonist because the protagonist is like you. You should read books where you feel a deep and intuitive connection to the protagonist and surprise you didn't expect to because the protagonist is different from you. And you should read books that um, uh, are, brand, are brand new and speak to, the issue, speak to the issues that we face here and now that have never been faced before. And you should read books that speak to issues that people have wrestled with for hundreds of years. I just think all of those things are true. Um, so, I, you know, I think the, the word canon is probably a disservice because my argument is not to, my, my purpose is not to argument for argue for the canon. For one. For one yes, canon. not for yeah. one canon. I, I think that like their, their schools should, should be intentional about book choice and think about canons as shared texts within the schools. And one of the things that they want, to, they should think about and accomplish among many, like let's assume that kids are going to read six or seven books a year, let's hope. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things they might want to accomplish with some of those books is, is cultural capital. Um, and let's hope the books that are cultural capital are also changing, you know, um, and that, um, you know, becoming is gonna become a part of the canon and everyone is gonna read that for, you know, like what a great book. Um, and uh, so I guess I don't see those things as, as, as exclusive. I just think there are, there are a variety of things we want to try and use books to expose kids to, especially now, you know, I mean, the hidden story of reading is that the book is dying, mm -hmm. that it's in, a, it's in a death struggle against the cell phone. And I'm not sure it's going to win. I'm not sure to what degree it's going to survive or win outside of schools and increasingly uh, you know, it used to be that you taught kids maybe six or seven books a year and you could, you know, we would hope that kids are going to read a lot more on their own and increasingly kids don't read on their own. Mm -hmm. And when they do, it's not books. And so book choices are rare and precious and should be made intentionally because we, you know, we just don't know how many kids will get to read and we want to make sure that they have read a you wise know, and balanced um, portfolio with oh, with our oh. with our best guess, and I don't, but I don't think it's you know uh, there are risks to that too, and I think you've pointed out some of them. Well, I think like, you know, reading in this way that we're talking about it right now could be a really elite enterprise. So if I drove from Los Angeles to New York and made a stop in every state and multiple places to get gas and talk to people, I would be talking to a ton of people who read all the time, all day. Mm -hmm in different contexts and in different ways, but we wouldn't be able to sit and talk about the, the finer points of Othello. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. right? We wouldn't. So the majority of the people, like I, I gave you the fictional cocktail party mm-hmm. in New York where we're all together and we can assume that everybody in the room has read a certain set of things. And that group of people is, uh, is abnormal in the, in the grand, grander scheme of America. And, and I only For bring sure. that up because when you say the book mm-hmm. is dying, um, I think the book has lost relevance and, and it's a very conservative industry authors and, and, mm-hmm. and writing and reading and, and it's selling books is super conservative. Right. Um, and, and hasn't, we could Can you say more about that. Well, I mean, you know, just, um, w- when I think about the fact that people are reading all the time, all day, so they obviously have gotten the skill, the ability to read, but we keep trying to sell them old stories in old ways when mm-hmm. media has like advanced like times 10. Right. Mm-hmm. So we could bemoan the fact that you have so many movies now with explosions and CGI and constant things happening at all times. And it makes it hard for mm-hmm. people to sit down, for instance, and watch little house on the prairie or read little house on the prairie. Maybe it's a function of something going awry in the culture, but maybe it's a function of the culture just growing and the industry didn't grow with it. Right, like the text. Sure, you could argue that the book. Industry. You could argue that the book industry is a cartel. <laughs> that, right, that it, can, it constrains the distribution of ideas. Yeah, and it keeps selling this. It keeps selling to the same class of people who are mm-hmm. shrinking, and that that class of people get in increasingly sure. um, um, in love with themselves about how much mm-hmm. they know and think and do. But like I said, if I drove from Los Angeles to New York, I would hit a bunch of readers who read all the time, all day long, yeah. in, in many contexts, to stay alive, they do. They have survival reading. Um, yeah. And I don't know that the fact that they don't have the context within, I don't know. I don't yeah. know that they, they don't know about Othello actually um, is the difference between how they read and how others read. <laughs> Here's here's one point and something that you said in, in your work that maybe supports this. I don't know. But you say that all teachers are reading teachers, right? Yeah. So, so to some degree, you know, reading is important be, across. Yeah. yeah, it should be across different things. Um, and what you and I have just been talking about is fiction. Right? Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. But if science is actually the thing that makes me read more, like I'm really into, say, maybe planets or something right. like this or whatnot, nonfiction really right. is the thing that hooks me on it. I still have to make inferences. I still have to like read beyond Absolutely. what I know already and all that. But nonfiction at that point becomes my access um, to reading yeah. versus what I learn in, in my reading class. I don't know if that supports my point or not. It just seems like it's it's something that to me that says that kids might access reading in, in their math class. That might be the way in which they get interested in it and it has nothing to do with yeah. the fiction. Well, that's one of the points that I really wanted to make in, in Teach Like a Champion and Reading Reconsider, which is one of the most valuable things I think you can do in a classroom is read. Um, you know, that like you should be reading in your math class and certainly in the science class. And in fact, if you're if you have the practical capacity to read, reading is actually a surprisingly hard thing to do in a classroom mm-hmm. to do to do it well and then do it in an engaging way. I mean, it's just like we've all we all remember being in school and what did it look like to read? Um, either the teacher would say, um, David, would you read, would you read chapter two? Would you read to the bottom of the page, please? And like, <laughs> we all sit, sit there and listen to David read at the bottom of the page, or it's one paragraph per person coming around the room and I can count ahead and know that I'm going to have a six paragraph and then I tune out. Um, one of the reasons why teachers don't read in the classroom, because it's, it's a hard thing to do in there and uh, not especially adept at being able to do it in a way that is engaging and builds culture that makes students love reading. But if you can master the sort of the, some techniques for how you read aloud, how you read in class, including read aloud or silently effectively, um, and it can become an engaging uh, and positive activity, then you have an incentive to read, or at least you've overcome a disincentive not to read. And I just think that I think that you're point that in disciplinary reading and nonfiction reading is at least as important as what we prize as a sort of hallowed ground of, uh, of literary fiction in English classes is at least as important. And I, you know, I just, mm-hmm. um, I've been, I've been, I'm writing, rewriting teach like a champion right now, version 3.0 and a colleague is just sort of helping me think it through. And one of the things we're going to add is this idea of, of our rigor checklist, which is if I'm a teacher and I want to have just a, a checklist of things that I go down 
after I've planned my lesson and I ask myself, is this plus, is this, is this, is this, is this lesson rigorous enough to serve what my students deserve? One of the questions I should ask myself is, have we, have we read from challenging and worthy text that will allow my students to be able to read within this discipline going forward? Um, one of my, and, and I think that that's, I think that's really, really important. One of my personal frustrations as a parent of kids is um, my kids are science-y and some of their science teachers have bought into this notion of the flipped classroom. And the idea of the flipped classroom is mm -hmm. um, you go home and you watch a video that gives you background on things and then you come in and we do the experiment in class. And so the, the lecture, instead of happening in the classroom, happens for homework on video mostly. And the thing that I see missing from that is having to read the textbook, which is how you learn to be a scientist or a doctor. And I know that there are other sources of information, but if you want to be able to thrive in a discipline, you have to be able to read the language of your of your discipline and you have to practice it and you have to read regularly. And I just don't, I don't, you know, my kids believe that they want to go to careers in science. And I don't think they read enough science to be able to really aspire to what they believe they can aspire to because it's much easier not to ask them to read. Mm -hmm. And so that's what their teachers sometimes do. And they won't be there to pick up the pieces five years down the road when they don't know when they, this I, actually, Chris has actually happened to me. When I went to college, I thought that I wanted to be a doctor and I took biology as a freshman and the professor sent us down to the science library to read a bunch of um, articles and I couldn't read them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a good, I was an English major, like I can read, but I couldn't under, I didn't know how to read science and I didn't know how to, how the discipline, how to read that discipline. And I dropped biology and, you know, it's funny, haha, you know, never, <laughs> never became happy, you know, everything worked out okay in the end, but like, um, you know, that, uh, that was, a, that was an aspiration that did not work out because I was not prepared to read disciplinary literature. Let me ask you a question that's kind of aside from some of the how in, in instruction and teaching right now. You are in a chain of, you work within a network of <laughs> charter schools, yeah. schools that I think have a lot of control over what they do and how they do it without having to turn a huge ship. But if I was a, a new superintendent coming into a district and I called you in privately as a consultant and said, hey, can you do the same thing you did over there? Go through my district and and kind of figure out the reading thing for us, right? Yeah. Big, big district. What, what's your prediction of what you would find as some of the, the key challenges, the problems, the, the things that aren't working? You wouldn't know that until you went and researched it. But what do you predict you would you would find? Yeah. Um. I think one of the first questions would be about curriculum, which is what are, what are we teaching and who decides and how? I mean, I think one of the, one of the hidden story, one of the hidden stories of teaching generally is how challenging it is to both be able to teach and lesson plan at a level that is um, sufficiently rigorous and demanding to prepare you to teach great lessons every day to five potentially different preparations of, uh, of 30 different kids and still have time and grading papers and et cetera, and going home and still having time to see your own kids and put them to bed. It's a huge ask, mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's multiplied even in, in English and in, in literature class and in, in English classes, because to teach reading well, there's such preparation involved. And so I think the first thing is, um, I think this is something that's very easy to do wrong, but I think there, uh, curriculum is a decision that should, that one, there needs to be very high quality curriculum. And I don't think it's reasonable to let most, to leave most teachers to say, teach whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I think that as teachers get, uh, I love, I love teachers and I love their autonomy and I want to preserve it. But I think that you earn your right to say, actually, I don't want to read this book, I'm going to read that book, or I want to read this book, but I'm going to throw out these lesson plans and I'm just going to freelance this on my own. I'm not, I'm not sure that in your first year of teaching, you should be doing that. Well, how do that, you learn that right? Like what would be, would be yeah. a way to say this teacher can do it, but this one can't? Uh, I mean, I, I think this is this should be the role of the principal. 
Uh, and it's a con I if, if it were me in the principal or if a district asked me how to do it, I would say, great, let's put together a series of questions that I would ask myself. Some of them would be as empirical as possible. Like I want to gather student work and see the quality of, of writing that students do about what they read. And I would like to see that they can read and comprehend challenging texts. And when we have evidence that they can do that, and I corroborate that with either myself or the, you know other other people who are knowledgeable of this say like yeah this is this is a teacher who's ready so, so um, this makes me want to be dogged on this question so yeah. excuse me for being dogged on it sure how does the principal earn the right uh i mean it requires you to have a good principal right good leading good it, there's only so far you're going to be able to get in running schools if if leadership can't make reliable solid decisions uh and i think that I think data is often misused. I think data should inform the decision of a uh, smart, uh, of a of capable leadership. So, um, you know, there's a lot of there's data out there that says that the average principal is not effective at identifying effective teaching when he or she sees it. Say that again. The there, 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 there is data out there that mm -hmm. that that there's research to suggest that the average principal is not an effective judge of good teaching when he or she sees it that, that the average principal can't can't uh, can't identify a teacher who will get significant results um, when he or she sees it but that doesn't mean that a good principal is not good at that right in fact that that's could, horrifying. Fact, that, could that, that could be the proficiency that that could be what makes a, a strong principal strong is their ability to spot powerful instruction yeah, but what and you just that, said, that should, be, that should be the correct. I'm not sure that's the criteria that we use when we're hiring principals, and that to yeah. me is that, that's the problem, right? Which but that's is, horrifying. That's yeah. like horrifying. Like yeah. what you just said, the average principal doesn't under doesn't know good teaching when they see it. I mean, I, yeah, I would say that, like, I would say that there's mixed data. There are people who yeah. will who will tell you that there is data out there that says you can't. That people use this as an as a reason to. Um, disempower principals and say principals should not be making decisions because principals can't make reliable decisions about instructions. Instruction. I don't quite believe that. I mean, I think that like I think that good principals can, and that if we don't believe in leadership in schools, um, I don't. I don't know the capacity of leadership in schools. I don't, I don't quite know where we go from there. I think the problem is that if that to the degree that you find that data compelling, and I think it's probably somewhat mixed. Um, the data is that way because we have. It's a, a cause, not an effect, or it's an effect, not a cause. It's the effect of having the wrong people in the principal seat. That mm -hmm. good, to me, the mark of a good principal is a deep understanding of instruction and per, and the ability to perceive what a great lesson is, which teachers reliably, a great principal should get data on their teachers and. Use it as a hypothesis, not a um, not a conclusion, and be able to say yes. I'm going to combine this with what I've seen on the ground to say, uh, look, there are great teachers who have their data is bad, and you know, like you get their, their standardized test data or whatever data you're using is bad in a year because data is noisy. And so, one of the things you know, I, a principal should be able to make a hunch and say, look, I just I believe in this teacher, and. I'm going to support them even though their data wasn't good. If, if they do that for three or four or five years in a row, that's not okay, right? Because mm -hmm. at some point, um, there's a preponderance of data here that's that's, that's overwhelming. Um, and there are, real, there are real kids' lives, you know, it, it's a risky decision to make. But on the other hand, uh, you know, the, the data is not always right. And so you need, leadership is critical here and that leadership has to be able to use data, but not be, but not have the data be, you know, you see lots of places where mm -hmm. um, LA Unified School District um, had data on years and years of value-added outcomes for teachers, and they never they never did anything with that data. They, they, they published it, didn't they? Right. Well, that's the thing. They they did what for years they didn't do anything, and then they put it in the paper, mm -hmm. and that to me is the worst thing that you can do with it because then suddenly it's like the decision is. You don't have a, uh, a leader who's making data informed decisions. The data mm -hmm. is the decision and data is, is 
in the aggregate right, but many of the data points are always wrong. And so mm -hmm. it needs to be a hypothesis that, um, that we use just, to make it. You just made my problem worse, though. You made my Sorry. problem worse. So, so, um, so I'm the hypoth or not, yeah, I'm the hypothetical um, new superintendent. I've called you in. <laughs> You've come back and you've told me, well, you know, principles are pretty important. And um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. a, a large number of your principles don't even know what good instruction looks like when they see it. Um, so that that's one of your findings. Like you go through my district, you find that mm -hmm. out. Um, that feels like a very hard problem to correct if you're running a big institution with legacy uh, departments and ways of doing things or whatnot that a charter school down the road might be able to fix faster. But as a superintendent of a district, it doesn't seem like you're in really good position to, to fix that. I mean, would that be wrong? Um, I believe that there are probably, no, I don't think it's wrong. I think it's. Uh... <laughs> Eric, Kalenz, <laughs> Eric Kalenz says, by the way, superintendents don't know good instruction either. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I, I'm hesitating at answering your question because yeah. I want to be, there are thousands of people who do great work, uh, who do really good work in, in school districts. And um, I don't, do I think it's a more challenging environment in which to identify the best people and hire them and support them and honor them when I don't have full flexibility in terms of how I hire people mm -hmm. and in terms of how I evaluate them? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, and education, I mean, uh, one of the most profound quotes about education is, you know, a, a system of education can never exceed the quality of it. The quality of a system of education can never exceed the quality of its people. The first thing I have to do is be able to identify talent, support talent, grow it, uh, build it, honor it, and sometimes make hard decisions about it when it isn't up to the standards of students that, um, uh, that's just that's that's critical. That, I, mean, I just think that's a critical piece of what we have to do if we want to have great schools. I think the other challenge, though, that that the average superintendent has is that um, I think that I, I believe in choice. I don't think that I don't think that charter schools are the only version of choice. But I think choice benefits not just parents and students, but it it benefits teachers too. Who wants to spend their life working away for an institution whose goals and beliefs they don't really believe they don't really buy into, and whose goal is to be left alone by the professional development of the of the district or the school because they don't buy into it? So let's say I have let's say I have a belief, and let's just say my belief is that I believe that writing is is fundamental and overlooked, and that every lesson that gets taught in my middle school should end with students writing and then revising one beautiful sentence mm -hmm. carefully wrought to summarize or describe or reflect on the content that we learned in this lesson. Mm -hmm. That is my belief in my school. In the average district, I could not exercise that belief and find out whether that belief has any, <laughs> has any validity or muscle to it because I couldn't hire people around it. And if I said to my math teacher, well, that we're, we're a writing intensive school and what we believe is that every lesson ends, my, my math teacher could either fold their arms and say, well, I don't really believe that writing stuff. Or they could say, yeah, sure, sure, sure. They could know that they could not agree with me, but and that they, when they get back to their classroom, they're just gonna creatively not comply. Mm -hmm. And unless I can make, it's not just that unless I can make decisions about philosophy and approach intentionally as a school, I can't really approach excellence. It said it's a disservice to the teachers themselves. Who wants to be that teacher? Well, it would be so much better if the te if uh, the teachers who believed in this vision of a writing intensive school could come to me, and the ones who didn't could go somewhere else. And we could, in the end, in three years, we'd know uh, mm -hmm. for for which kids this worked and for which it didn't. We'd know a lot more than if every school was a muddy mixture of philosophies, undifferentiated, uh, stewed together, and uh, and never pursued with fidelity. So I think that that. Uh, it's very challenging in many districts. I, you know, I, I don't know all districts well enough, but it's, I think it's very challenging in many districts to build a system of where where teachers choose and are chosen by their belief in the 
in the mission and philosophy of a school. And I think that's central to making a great institution and great organization is we have a set of beliefs, hmm. have things that we want to pursue. We're not a shopping mall where everyone opens their own store and they get to do what they want. Like we are going to pursue some ideas together that we believe based on the research are right. And we're going to do them as well as we possibly can. And then we're going to look really carefully at what we've learned about our capacity to do this. And then we'll know whether we're right or wrong. You know, that flies in the face in some ways of part of the national narrative about trust teachers and let te right. leave teachers alone, let them teach. Um, we have policymakers, we have politicians, we have um, armchair com commentary people like me, and we have uh, mm -hmm. um, journalists who think they know something. And, um, and all of it, the response to all of it is, you guys aren't educators. Let teachers teach. Leave them alone. Just let them shut their door and teach. They know what to do. They're the experts on their kids. And you guys are just getting in the way you're meddling. Um, I, I feel very shaky about that narrative, right? Because that narrative, when you just said something about uh, a system will never exceed the quality of its people, um, I actually am not somebody who has a lot of faith that the systems that I'm looking at, the ones that I have the most trouble with, are full of really high quality people that you should just leave alone, that don't need support and help and guidance and you know training um, beyond what they have now. I think, I think the other thing is that good people want to get better. Uh, and so if you don't have systems that invest in people, talented people leave, right? They go do other things because they want to be challenged and they want to be grown and they want to be invested in by the, I do trust, I, I love and believe in teachers, but I don't think that that means that every teacher gets to decide what they want to teach on their own and there's no oversight and there's no supervision and there's no feedback. I think that, um, uh, I just don't think that that's Work is done without. I think one of the useful things that uh, a really useful thing to think about is that accountability and autonomy should live at the same place in an organization. Which is, if you want to make decisions, great. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you get to make every decision. There's someone you always, you know, everyone has a boss. There's people you answer to to explain your decision. It doesn't mean that uh, I always tell you exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. But there are there's a range of decisions that I delegate to you to make. And when you make them, you're accountable for the results. And so if you want to make decisions about, hey, I want to decide how I teach. Hey, I want to decide what I teach. You also have to be accountable for, you have to measure what happens afterwards so we can learn from it. And then you have to be accountable for it. And so that you have to be ready to say, and if the results aren't good, then I'm going to change what I do. Yeah, Michelle yeah, Johnson is. here is watching, who's an educator. She said, but too many teachers are content poor. They are bad writers. Yeah. They don't like math. I can't trust that. Good people want to get better, but not all are good. I agree with her. Yeah, it sounds like um, maybe a trust but verify I mean, situation. The trust but verify is a great. Yeah. I think there's so many things packed into that, into that, um, into Michelle's phrase there. Um, one is, I think, your point about trust but verify. The other thing is that background knowledge is a, you know, is a is an issue for students, and it's an issue for for teachers too, right? It's very hard to find. Um, people who want to do the really challenging work of teaching and who also are experts in physics or, <laughs> uh, you know, we need a lot of experts in physics to staff a lot of schools and a lot of places and a lot of those places are tough to teach in. It's really, you know, um, there are a lot of teachers who are content poor, also in part because I think we've, for years, we've undervalued the importance of knowledge and facts. And so, um, and our, you know, you could argue that schools of education contribute to that. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, when, when the preparation pipeline doesn't value content sufficiently as part of your preparation, you get a content poor teaching staff. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, one of, the, one of the things I believe from having run schools is that what do you want to select for when you're, when you're choosing teachers? I want to select for a love of a love of getting better as a teacher and I want to select for background knowledge and content of your discipline. If I can find someone who knows a ton about what they're teaching and they love to get better and they want to, they like it when someone comes into their classroom and gives them feedback and talks to them about and shares research with them. If I, as a, if I running a school can't make that person better and can't, can't help that person succeed if they're willing to work hard and they're open-minded and they're flexible and they have a growth mindset, then I think that I'm doing something wrong as an organization.
Hmm. If that person has background knowledge and, and they're willing to work hard. And in fact, um, so the, the things that I, so I think I should, I, I should be able to help people get better in the course of their, of their career. That should be one of the core things that I'm good at as an institution, because teaching is such complex, challenging work and there's so much to it. But the things that I can't provide that I have to hire for are, are knowledge of my field. I can't teach someone the history of the history of literature or physics, you know, to, to in, in, within my school. And I can't give them a learning modality and a, a love for the, the craft of teaching and the desire to get better at it for the every day for the rest of their lives. You know, Dia Jones here, who's watching, she asked the question, how do we improve the preparation pipeline? I think it's particularly mm -hmm. a great question based on what you just said, because um, in many school districts across America, content is not part of the pre preparation right. that is valued highly, as a matter right. of fact. As a matter of fact, you have people who have the content expertise and knowledge who have to go through an onerous path to get into teaching, to get into the classroom. And then you have people who don't know the content at all, who barely pass the things that, you know, the gates that you need to get through to get in a classroom, right. who want us to lower the bar for what you need to know and, and how much you know, the content is important right. to yourself. So, so that's a preparation breakdown. Right. We're dismissive of knowledge everywhere. In the, ironically, we're dismissive of knowledge everywhere in the education sector because we don't think knowledge, to go back to where we were about reading, we, we, we don't really believe in our actions that knowledge is that important. <laughs> in, Which is in, shocking. I was about it's to say, in the learning system? <laughs> right, the, it's shocking. The learning system of the United States, you're saying that there is a, a poverty of interest in knowledge, <laughs> um, which is pretty astounding to me. Shocking, but true. <laughs> wow. Um, I know we're, we're getting close on time, but I, I want to keep going back to the scene. I'm so curious about several things, especially as a parent. I'm listening to everything you say as a parent. You and educators are watching this, and, and you are on the education side of this. But I listen to all these things through the lens of a parent. Um, and, and so much of what you're saying makes me feel like, man, there's just too much. There is a lot going wrong in my life right now because some of the things you're saying I know for sure don't exist in some of, I mean, in my life, in some of what we're watching with, with teachers. But this thing about writing, um, mm -hmm. I noticed, came up in your work that I would have never thought, I, th I would have thought you could be a good reader without being a great writer. Yeah. Um, and and w first of all, whoever said this in our comments here about the teachers not knowing how to write, we have teachers that write things sometimes to us that are a little bit alarming, like when we look at the writing. But, but I, I wanted to ask you through this other lens. We have, um, for instance, a daughter who loves to, um, do both read and mm -hmm. write and she's really good with the writing she's young but it feels native in my mind when i look at her but the boys you know the writing part is not nearly as um pronounced as the the reading part <laughs> getting good on the writing side but the reading side just isn't really something yeah. they care about don't want to do really yeah you know if you make them do it it's almost like punishment um yeah. in some ways um why is the writing part so important <sighs> I think writing is one of the most profound tools for, well, for a variety of types of thought, but for deep, for deep thought in particular, when you write something, you have to make a series of careful, intentional decisions about word choice, about syntax that you can kind of fudge if you're talking. Like right now, me talking to you, like, okay, I'm moving my hand here, and that helps me to capture some of what I'm trying to say so my word choice doesn't have to be quite as precise. Mm -hmm. And I can take and I take my time when I'm writing. It's permanent. It's in front of me. And so I'm accountable for being able to go back and choose exactly the right word to capture my idea. Uh, and so the, the level of decisions that I have to make, the specificity of decisions that I have to make to communicate my ideas in writing, it's, it's, it's a higher bar. It's a more rigorous level of thought. And I think over time that teaches you the discipline to think well and to think deeply. And also probably, there's other, I mean, I think that there's a correlation to being a better reader and that if you're intentional to how language is created, you're a more effective reader and a more effective writer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I, I guess I think that, you know, there's a permanence. To, so one, I think that you have to think more deeply and more precisely to be able to put it into writing. But you also, once it's in writing, it's permanent. And so then you can go back on it and reflect on it and improve it. I think one of the most profound arguments in the classroom should be the first idea is rarely sufficient, is rarely fully correct. 
And so when I write it, one of my favorite things to do in a classroom is to ask students a question and ask them to write about it. What might Jonas be feeling at the end of this chapter? And then to have a discussion after the writing has happened first. And one of the things I know about this discussion is the discussion is gonna be better because everyone has thought it through in advance in writing. And so they have something to say and everyone's gonna participate and their ideas are gonna be better. And if I'm smart as a teacher, I can walk around beforehand and look over a student's shoulder and say, mm, Chris, you've got something interesting to write. Why don't you start us off on this conversation and I can do what we call hunting, not fishing, which is I can choose really valuable places to start the discussion. Mm -hmm. And people can listen better when they have their ideas in note form in front of them and they're not trying to remember what they wanted to say when someone else is talking you hear this all the time in classrooms a teacher calls on a student and the kid says what i wanted to say before chris was before chris made his point which is a way of saying i wasn't listening to what chris said chris what chris said didn't matter to me anyway mm -hmm. why do why do kids do that they do that because they're trying to remember what they wanted to say the whole time but if they've written it down it's permanent they can refer back to it they can actually listen to what the person who goes before them says and they can they can build off it and so i think writing changes the discussion. But then after the discussion, in my ideal world, the teacher then says, now go back to what you wrote before the discussion and revise it based on what you've heard in this conversation. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the power, the power of that is that it changes the purpose of discussion. Mm -hmm. Because in many classrooms, the purpose of discussion is to win. Mm -hmm. It's to be proven the person who was right all along. And in many, you know, like, I don't think it's a coincidence that that sounds a lot like American political discourse, a bunch of people shouting at each other looking to be proven right. But if the goal of discussion is to harvest ideas that people say around me that I can use to upgrade and improve my own original thinking, then my goal is no longer to win, it's to listen and to, prove my, and to improve my own thinking. And the discussion actually becomes a discussion as opposed to a series of pontificators or an argument, etc. Mm -hmm. And so the writing there, framing the discussion in writing, the idea of the iterative the iterativeness of writing like the goal of like when, when it's permanent i can then go back and improve it and be and think about what i originally wrote and how what i think now is different allows me to make a lot of really fundamental shifts about what we're trying to do in the classroom even down to what i'm doing during discussion i'm looking to improve my ideas i began here i end here you know what this is driving me so crazy so we have tilly elverum who is a parent champion is watching this and she says this con conversation is giving me heartburn as a parent. <laughs> oh, no. um, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, so let me just go through a couple of comments. David Weingartner okay. um, says, take your child on tours of ed schools that want 150 K from you. Your heartburn will turn into a heart attack. Um, David McGuire, who's a school leader says we moved this year from having a writing teacher and a reading teacher. Um, teaching writing should be uh, taught in collaboration with reading because the text, um, but tasks are different uh, skill set as a teacher. Um, uh, Michelle Johnson, who's an educator here, is what made me just get get my point about as a parent, I'm, I'm getting heartburn like, um, like Tilly is. She says the writing revolution, which I love because you can Great see book. the revolution will be will be literate, right? So yeah. I love the words liter uh, um, revolution on this. She says think, write, pair, share, revise. Again, mm -hmm. think, write, pair, share, revise. I wish that there was a way to teach parents some of these concepts so that when we're helping our kids at home, if we want to mm -hmm. be great, let's mm -hmm. say we wanted to be super um, supportive of the learning process and great at home, that someone could translate some of this stuff. Maybe you need a book called Parent Like a Champion. Um, I, I think enough people hate me already. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we probably need this like, hey, if you did want to be a good supportive partner at home to your educator, let me super simplify the concepts that they're that's that are going on in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So that at home, like this thing that Michelle Johnson is saying, I'm going to have to think on this a little bit, like think, write, pair, share, revise. We're already making our kids do some things at home. Right. I don't know that we're doing them in that sequence or that order, but someone needs to make this simple for us. I do want to say too, Dia Jones said earlier in, in this, when can we expect Doug to do a Teach Like a Champion 3.0? Um, I'm writing it right now. Right. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's the manuscript is due at the end of the summer and it will hopefully be out in um, stores in the spring. And uh, 
thank you in advance to all the amazing teachers who I'm like, I, I, I get up at five, I write from five to eight in the morning uh, on this and one other book that I'm trying to write. Uh, and it's, uh, it's so amazing to watch what great teachers do in the classroom. I'm going to do my best to try and acquit them, do, acquit them as they deserve to be acquitted by getting all that into the book. So uh, I'm working on it and uh, doing my best. Hmm. But a lot of Good. it, you know, obviously, like one of the one of the big areas that I the, the whole uh, read, write, uh, discuss, revise is one of my favorite concepts. So that's in Teach Like a Champion 2.0, sort of one of the new things that I've learned. And so. Um, the big chapter that I'm working on right now is on lesson preparation, which is how do you get ready to teach a lesson, whether you've planned it yourself or not. Uh, so there's some new stuff in there that I'm really excited about also. So um, fingers crossed. Awesome. Um, you've been very generous with your time today, and I appreciate it. We have some great comments here. Are there any resources or anything you want to point people to? I, I have had your Twitter um, handle going across the bottom so that people know how to get in touch with you. If they need Thanks to get in that. touch with you. But is there anything that you think, yeah. you know, we have uh, many yeah. people here watching that they should, uh, what, what would you point them towards in terms of resources, anything that they should check out? Well, to your question about writing, I really feel that um, The Writing Revolution by Judith Hockman is a really great book. Um, it really gets down to the notion of the fundamental issue to me in, in writing for American students is sentence craft, which is students, uh, that we should think about writing as a form of deliberate practice and that we, that students, we assign writing, but we don't really teach writing. And that the gap is in crafting single sentences that capture an idea, a complex idea with nuance. And that's actually something that you can practice and develop exercises around. And I think uh, Judith does a great job of addressing that in, mm -hmm. um, and one of the other things, one of the other areas that I think is so critical, if I'm to go back to your question about being a parent, one of the, you know, obviously reading aloud to your kid is, is uh, to your child is one of the most valuable things you can do. But building vocabulary is so important. And I think that um, we're so familiar with teaching vocabulary that we often overlook it. And I think that for the most part, most American teachers presume that vocabulary is a skill and they teach it as a skill. Uh, who can guess what the word um, mimic means in the sentence? Uh, has anyone ever heard it used before? Who can guess from the from the context clues around it what the word might mean here? That's all sort of presuming that I can develop the skill of inferring word meaning from context. Um, Isabel Beck has a book called Bringing Words to Life, and it's it's all about developing vocabulary, and it's brilliant and insightful. And one of the things that she pushes us to do is to think about active practice, which is it's more powerful to give students a definition. Mm -hmm. To mimic means to imitate, but in a negative and pejorative way. So if I was going to uh, mimic someone on my basketball team, what might I do to mimic them, right? And now I take the time I spent trying to guess at what the word means to trying to practice using the word in different settings. Um, and the benefits are of it that I'm, I'm practicing problem solving and using the word in a variety of settings. And it's really fun and engaging. Uh, and I'm starting with the definition as opposed to, as opposed to hoping to end at the definition. And I think that's just, that's just one of the most fundamental things that we've tried to do in the reading curriculum that we've written. So one, I think that that's a resource. People should read the, should read the book, it's tremendous. But if there's one thing I would wanna do with my child would also just be a lot of wordplay to, to take vocabulary words and ask, you know, fun games that we can think of to ask my kids to use and apply uh, words in challenging new ways once we get them. Because I think vocabulary is probably the single most important form of background knowledge. Awesome. Well, we're going to be expecting uh, Teach Like a Champion 3.0, and you're in the process of doing it already. Um, I do think you need more people to hate you, so you should write um, Parent, Parent Like a Champion um, 1.0, and I'd be all for it. Um, for you people, should write it and I'll send you so I'll send you a page or two of notes and then, then got it. You're, on, you're on the hook from there. <laughs> got it. I'm going to steal the uh, steal the, the template um, for people watching. 
Um, number one, thank you for engaging and watching in this daily broadcast. And please sh share it with other folks if you think it has value and adds value. Please write to me and let me know where it's, uh, you know, it's working and it's not working for you. And things that I should have asked or should have done, um, please write me and let me know. Um, but I do want to give away three copies of um, Doug's book, where he's the co-author of the book, um, Reconsidering Reading. To anybody who's watching this right now, the first three that email me at Christopher at activist.com christopher at activist.com first three people get a copy of doug's book and um and i would love to talk to anybody in our chain here of comments about this further maybe even thinking through um how we can have a parent book club around how we translate some of these classroom activities or our expect expectations and goals and 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 uh talents and whatever into something that parents can support at home in the way that we do our supportive parenting of our kids at home i think that would be great um and it would be great to have educators and parents uh, working together in that either book club or discussion group however so that we can get the the translation right um doug thank you so much i appreciate it my pleasure thanks for having me on I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Talk to you soon.